Welcome. Um, I'm excited to welcome you all to Eat, Poop, Die, How Animals Make Our World, a conversation with Joe Roman, uh, presented by the New England Aquarium Lecture Series. I'm Philip Hamilton. I'm a senior scientist and interim chair at the um, Krauss Marine Mammal Program here at the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life at the Aquarium. Uh, the aquarium is a nonprofit conservation organization that has been protecting and caring for the ocean for over 50 years. We're delighted to be hosting this talk today on World Ocean Day, of no, no other, and grateful to the Lowell Lecture Institute for their generous support, which allows the aquarium to offer this, these programs for free. Our speaker this evening shares our passion for protecting the blue planet and is here to talk about his work as a conservation biologist and scientist. Dr. Joe Roman is a researcher at the University of Vermont and an award-winning author who studies endangered species and conservation and marine ecology. Joe is also a good friend of the aquarium. I and many others here uh, at the Anderson Cabot Center have worked with him over the years doing our right whale research in the Bay of Fundy. Joe's research receives support from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Fulbright Scholar Program, and the Rockefeller Bellagio Center Residency Program. It's a long description. Um, and he is currently a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard, where he worked on his forthcoming book, which is titled After This Talk, which is due for release in November. His most recent book titled Listed, Dispatches from America's Endangered Species Act, an insightful account of how preserving biodiversity helps both economies and communities thrive, won the 2012 Rachel Carson Environmental Book Award. Joe is also the author of the book Whale and writes frequently for the scientific and popular press, including Audubon, New Scientist, the New York Times, and Slate, among others. In addition to marine ecology, he has a passion for cooking, and his website, Eat the Invaders, offers a delicious recipes to help mitigate invasive species, one forkful at a time. And I just checked this out today. It's really beautiful. It's a cool website. Joe earned a master's in wildlife ecology and conservation from the University of Florida and a doctorate in org organismic and evolutionary biology from Harvard University. It is my great honor to welcome our speaker, Joe Roman. Thank you, Philip. Um, uh, about a year or two ago, I was introduced as having gotten my doctorate in orgasmic and revolutionary biology, and I'm still looking for that uh, department, if anyone could point me in that direction, but you managed to get through it. Um, thanks to Vicki Spruill and, uh, for inviting me and Maria Palomino for all the work in making this happen. I really appreciate it. This is quite a trip from memory lane to me. I um, I think it was 1994 was the first time I went out on the water to study whales and um, spent a field season with Philip, um, Marilyn Marks, who's out here, Amy Knowlton, uh, Scott Krause, Chris Slay, Lisa Conger, and Mo Brown uh, were the folks that I spent, I got spent a summer, two summers maybe, um, on the Nereid on the Bay of Fundy. And we'll talk a little bit about that work, but it was an amazing year and uh, I would not be here without you guys. So thank you for that. Um, I also wanna thank Dave Wiley who helped a lot on a lot of this work. He's based out of Stellwagen and um, Carolyn Severese, who's here, um, who helped me um, sell this book a couple of years ago. So love you guys. Thanks so much for that. Today, I'm going to talk about a couple of um, chapters uh, in, in the new book that's coming out, focusing on my work on, on whale research um, and diving into uh, a couple of different species. So uh, in November 14th, 1963, there was an er a volcanic eruption off the coast of Southeast Iceland. This is what it looked like in those first days. Um, 
it erupted 400 feet beneath the surface of the ocean. There was a fishing boat right nearby. Um, so they were the first to see the smoke come up. And then by the end of the day, there was an eruption column of tephra, which includes ash, cinders, lapilli rock, frag, rock fragments, uh, about the size of rabbit pellets. Um, and they dwarfed the fishing boat and the smoke from the explosion rose about 500 feet above the sea surface. I'll show you a quick video from that. Um, it's a film clip from Iceland from that first day. He's gonna say 1967 because that's when the film came out, but it's actually um, from 1963, just these images. On the 5th of June, 1967, the volcanic activity off the south coast of Iceland, known as the Sertse eruption, came to an end. This eruption went on for three and a half years and was not lacking in variety while it lasted. The first visible activity began on the 14th of November, 1963, an explosive eruption that continued most of the winter. It was very powerful at times, though on occasions there were pauses for a while. So that's what it looked, this is what it looked like um, those first couple of months. You can see that column, it reached up to a couple of miles into the sky. And um, at that point, they was growing at about 25 square meters um, per second or um, a great pyramid of Giza every day. So it was growing really quickly at that point. Um, as he had said, around 1967, so about four years later, the eruption stops. Um, and this is what Surtsey, uh, the island, looks like now. Um, I visited it in 19, it, rather in 2021, um, to look not only at the geological forces, but also to see what the role that animals might play on this island as well. It's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, in part just because it's one of the youngest islands uh, on the planet, but also because Iceland has protected it since it emerged. So only a handful of people can go there a year. And um, they've also been studying how the, the animals and plants change over time. Um, so it's really, as one ecologist called it, um, an ecologist dream world. Um, and these are the first two birds that nested on the island in 1970. Uh, they're black elements uh, on the left there, picture by Erling Olafsson, who's been working on that island uh, since that time. And then there's a fulmar on the right there. So early on, birds are landing, of course, taking off. And these are the first two birds that survive there. This is what roughly what Surtsey looked like early on. And it, this is a picture from two years ago. It still looks like that. Uh, it's mostly black lava with a few maritime plants. Um, what the, the maritime plants can survive there as opposed to the windborne plants because they can float on the ocean and bring nutrients with them. So uh, Surtsey is phosphorus rich, so it has phosphorus, there's carbon there, but it's nitrogen limited. So um, just like you have to fertilize your own garden without the nitrogen in the system, there's very little growth. So just those, just the plants that come and pack their own nutrients in are surviving. That started to change in the 1980s. Seabirds showed up and more and more they were landing in this breeding colony in the southern part of the island. Seabirds release up to three ounces of poop per day. And on Surtsey, the breeding colony, um, at the center of the breeding colony, they're depositing about 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. And that's um, roughly what people add to managed pastures, right? So what's the effect of all of this poop? That's the breeding colony. So here's what it looks like right across the, uh, on the most of the island and then where the birds are. Um, 50 times biomass in that area. So they've measured the, ch the chemical composition and changes there and seen the widespread impact uh, of these birds on this system. 
those of you who study ecology know you never get systems that are this straightforward. It's really complicated, as one of my um, colleagues said. Um, ecology isn't rocket science. It's a lot harder. Um, and we're often faced with looking at very small changes. Here's an enormous change. How did it occur? Um, by this timeline that you can see above, the different breeding birds showing up. So um, in the first species, those maritime species of plants arrive in the, in the mid 1960s. They can survive with their own nutrients. Fulmars come in, kitty wakes, you're getting a few species starting to survive. But then in the 1980s, when the gulls, herring gulls, blackback gulls, greater blackback gulls arrive, that's when you get this enormous um, burst of life. And now we've got meadow grasses and new species coming in. Along with those grasslands, you're getting new birds that are insects are coming and then insectivorous birds are arriving and puffins are showing up. Um, Iceland has more than half of the, um, North, the North Atlantic puffins nest there. Um, so as one biologist said, that's gonna be the future of Circe is going to be, it's, it's going to be a land of puffins. Since the 1980s, other species are showing up as well, and this is gray seals have started pupping on the northern part of the island, and that green area there, it's basically a seal oasis. We have a breeding bird oasis and a seal oasis, so they're releasing nitrogen in the form of placentas, also in the form of pea. Um, pee and poop. And um, it's not as high, it's not 60 pounds per acre, but about 15 pounds per acre. So they're having a change too. And you can see these changes from space. That green area at the bottom there is the breeding bird colony. And you can just make out maybe at the top the, um, the seal colony. Um, the gull colony, the biomass, as you can see on the left, that blue and red are the biomass and the gull colonies. And then this more recently, the seals are coming in. And at the bottom, when there are no animals, you can see there's barely any growth at all. So Circe is a good place to, to start to explore this, but it's just one. There are animals moving around the planet all the time. This is some work from um, some colleagues in Germany that um, show as animals move, um, they're, they're shown by these uh, light patterns here. There we go. You can see them migrating through the year. So this is about a year's migration of everything from bison to whales, mostly birds, turtles. And you can see that in some ways animals are, um, if plants are the lungs of the planet, animals are like the arteries or the beating heart of the planet. Um, let's do that one again, because it's so beautiful to see that over time. So the, the animals are, are moving these nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, iron, from areas where there's lots of productivity. The seabirds are feeding in the oceans, they're coming on land, they're releasing those nutrients in the poop. These animals are moving nutrients either in the form of pee or poop, but also in the form of carcasses and for mammals, placentas, for birds, um, eggs. So, so you're getting this, this, this movement from high nutrient levels to low nutrient levels. But with this movement um, also comes risk. Um, as any of us who have studied whales know that when whales move around or animals move around, especially in a planet dominated by humans, they can be put at risk. Um, and this shows one uh, baleen whale that uh, stranded in, off the Everglades National Park in 2019. It's a 37-foot whale. It's a uh, baleen whale, looks like um, what are known as brood as whales. So these are generally subtropical, tropical whales. They don't migrate very far. Um, and there's a few that are found in the Gulf of Mexico. There really aren't many endemic ones on this inside of Florida. So a necropsy was taken, like an autopsy for animals, and it indicated that it was an adult male. Um, and there were no external signs of trauma. So it hadn't been hit by a ship or um, caught in, in fishing gear. And the DNA from it matched that of the Gulf of Mexico whale. And this is a species that's just been described in the past couple of years. 
there are sadly only about 30 to 50 individuals left on the planet right now. It's the rarest large whale on earth. It's critically endangered. And um, sadly, when they cut open the gut, this is what they found, uh, a shard of plastic about this big. So the whale was emaciated, it had swallowed this plastic, it caused necrosis and necrosis in the stomach, and the whale died of plastic, right? So this is, this is what we're up against um, when, we're, when we're talking about today being World Oceans Day, we're talking about saving the oceans, is uh, a lot of factors that these whales are facing. Uh, the good news is um, a lot of, for a lot of species, we've really turned this around. Um, and, and as the crime writer Raymond Chandler wrote, all great crime stories are stories of redemption. So I hope at some point I'll be able to tell you a story of redemption for the, the Gulf of Mexico whale and maybe um, how much plastic we're putting in the oceans. Um, this really started to change in the United States. We, we saw this shift in, um, in protection of whales. Before that, whales had been heavily harvested. Commercial, commercial whaling had reduced whale numbers by 60 to up to 90% for species like the, the southern blue whale numbers were down uh, 99%. After the passage in 1972 of the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act in 1973, several marine mammal species have recovered. This is the eastern gray whale. Um, it was delisted in 1994. It went from a population of about 11,000 to 27,000 in 2016. It showed the power of these laws. Marine Mammal Protection Act restricts any intentional killing uh, of, uh, of any marine mammal, and the Endangered Species Act, of course, protects species that are at risk of extinction. Here's maybe one of the best stories and one that we can hope uh, we can tell about right whales someday, uh, North Atlantic right whales, as well as um, the Gulf of Mexico whale. Northern elephant seals uh, were so endangered in 1900, uh, they were down to 20 individuals. So there were there are more Northern elephant seals in this picture than there were in the planet at that time. Uh, now there are 179,000, uh, as many as there ever been. And that's all thanks to work by the United States as well as Mexico, intentional changes uh, to protect these species, evidence that we can do this, we can really turn this around. For me, uh, most remarkably, I think, I grew up in New York City and uh, Long Island. I never saw a whale as a kid. Uh, really, I don't think I ever saw a marine mammal um, in, in New York. And now I can regularly see humpbacks, fin whales are there. Um, seals have come back. It really is remarkable. That's thanks to the two laws that we spoke about, but also the Clean Water Act, as well as the Magnuson-Stevens Act protecting fish. So there's more prey. The waters are much cleaner than they ever were before. And now uh, two thirds of US marine mammals uh, with known trends are increasing and about three quarters of the great whales um, have rising populations. That's a cause for celebration here in the United States, um, but not every country thinks so. So when I was doing, after working with uh, Marilyn and um, Philip at, at the aquarium, um, I went to get my master's degree at the University of Florida and started reading more about um, Japan, Norway, Iceland, and to some degree Canada had was con were concerned about these increases in populations, uh, whale populations, in part uh, because they eat our fish. They could be competition um, with um, fisheries, and also uh, they claimed, and this was on the website uh, until recently, it may still be up. That not only is it more whales endangering human fisheries, but also other whales. So the minke whale at the bottom of this, uh, it's a small whale hunted in, by Norway and Japan. As those populations go up, they were claiming that in other endangered species, war populations weren't growing as well because there were too many small minkies. Therefore, we should hunt them. 
This was in the back of my mind while I was taking a class on marine ecology at the University of Florida, where I learned about one basic uh, idea, basic concept in the oceans, which is called the biological pump. Taking a class um, by Larry McEdward at the time, and the idea of this biological pump is um, photosynthesis can only occur at the surface of the ocean. Why? Because they're, it's limited by light. Um, and then when uh, phytoplankton, algae, or zooplankton, the animals that eat it, when they eat the, 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 the algae at the surface and die, or when they move down and defecate, that organic matter sinks to the bottom. So this is the idea of a biological pump, basic concept. I was sitting in the back of the room thinking about my time on the Bay of Fundy and realized after having watched right whales for a number of years, which feed at depth, um, and sometimes we'll even see mud on their heads or their bonnets, they'll come to the surface to breathe, to digest, and also to poop. And um, I thought, well, here's an example of the movement of nutrients going in a different direction. So uh, my family, we, we recently insulated our attic and I found my notes from that lecture. And uh, there you can see that drawing. I'm like, well, one other thing is happening. So this is as Nick Edward is talking about is that when you watch right whales, they feed at depth, they come to the surface, they release feces, and that can be picked up by phytoplankton, the nitrogen. Again, we're talking about these limiting nutrients picked up by the plankton, and then the copepods, the zooplankton that feed on that, um, can feed on that phytoplankton. So you're getting what, what we consider a positive feedback loop. And even then, because there are only about 350 um, right whales in the ocean at that time, on the left I wrote, but what about when there were 10,000 whales? Because we look at many parts of the ocean are still depauperate in many species. And um, I also was a, you could tell I was a graduate student at that point because I might had to remind myself to eat uh, there on the right. So I was working on a couple of different projects at that point. It took me a couple of years to get to revisit this. And basically, since I'm a conservation biologist and I study animals, uh, I needed someone to talk to about this who had a background as a biological oceanographer. So um, I discussed this with Jim McCarthy, who was at Harvard at that time. And most biological uh, oceanographers, I have to say, were like, yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, I'm sure there's some nitrogen in this feces, but you know, what's the ecological impact? As uh, one colleague, Dick Barber, said, you know, is it ecologically important or is it a fart in a hurricane? Right, so, and that's really what we've been set out to measure. And Jim was willing to entertain this idea. So you see that biological pump where those where the nutrients are falling down and then this whale pump where it's bringing it up, right? So um, we built a model for this and um, found that here off the Gulf of Maine, that it's actually quite a bit of nitrogen that whales, and by the way, seabirds are doing this too, as well as seals, but we were measuring whales at this point. They move about 24,000 metric tons of nitrogen per year to the surface. And that's as much as all the rivers combined uh, in this area, and about as much as coastal point source, which is human sewage, as it turns out, and not as much as atmospheric deposition, which is high um, because of pollution and agricultural activities. But we were excited. This showed to us that whales were could have a big impact on this system. We sent it to a high-flying journal, and it was rejected. Um, uh, but one and one reviewer had a point. It's like you guys are there, you know, you're right on the coastline. You've put this model together. Why aren't you out in the water measuring this? And uh, that's like, oh uh, yeah, we, you know, we figured he had a point. Um, as it turned out, some colleagues uh, at the the New England Aquarium were, were already out on the water working on whale feces. Um, and that would be Roz Rolland, Scott Krause. Um, Phil Hamilton and others were, were actually out of the water studying this. So we thought maybe we can get out there and collect some samples ourselves. Um, but, you know, it's not easy to find whale feces out in the ocean. So um, Roz, this is work based on, on Roz. One way to optimize finding it is um, through their smell, all right? Humans can smell whale feces when we get close enough. Um, 
but there's another way and uh, using wildlife detecting dogs. This is Fargo, which is a 90 pound Rottweiler, started off his career as a um, companion dog and to an elderly woman. And when she went into um, managed care, he became a sniffer dog in the prison system out in Washington state. And then um, got what I think for many dogs would be a dream job, became a wildlife detecting dog, uh, working on everything from grizzlies to other, um, other scats out west. Uh, Roz and, and Scott had the crazy idea that if it works on land, maybe it'll make uh, work on water as well. And it did. Um, and they were finding samples at about two and a half times more often than when people were just looking for it um, at the surface. Unfortunately for Fargo, he suffered from seasickness. Um, so uh, Roz had to give him Dramamine um, before every trip. And his colleague, Bob, who eventually uh, ended up with Philip, um, was really afraid of whales. So he would hide um, whenever the, uh, the smell and, and the sight of whales when they got too close. And Bob was lucky enough to retire to Vermont with Philip at the end of, uh, I think, that pilot year. This is what it looks like. Um, when this, this scent cone, so they're following a scent cone, just like if you've ever watched a dog follow a scent on land, they're sallying back and forth upwind. Uh, in this case, someone's driving the boat and uh, someone's watching the tail and Rottweilers have very little tails. I think Philip used to call it the happy inch um, when he was on a, 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 on a, on a scent. And you can see that, that the, um, that black square is when Fargo detects the scent going upwind. When there's an X, he's off the scent, so he's settled down. Then he's hitting that scent again when they're moving in, and then eventually going up at a nautical mile away and finding um, that fecal sample. The circle is where humans can detect it. So um, we got a few right whale samples and then also went out onto Stellwagen Bank and uh, collected samples from humpbacks. And after all of that, finally, yes, there is a high amount of nitrogen in those fecal samples. So we got those samples, analyzed them, found that limiting nutrient. Nitrogen matters in places like Stellwagen Bank or the Bay of Fundy, and that, that, that is the limiting nutrient, and it's high in those systems. And then we also did time course experiments. We added feces to, um, to, to jars that included uh, phytoplankton and found that the growth was faster there. So uh, success in that regard. And if you're wondering what whale feces looks like, um, I think each one is as individual as a snowflake. Um, yeah, everyone looks different and all beautiful in different ways. Uh, on the lower left uh, shows what it looks like when whales are feeding on fish, which we've described as sort of it looks like over steeped green tea. It's very loose. Um, on the upper right is blue whale feces. They're feeding on krill. It's very buoyant. It clumps together, similar to what you might see um, with right whales. Uh, so uh, the dogs helped. Uh, they're, I don't think they're being used out, out on the ocean anymore, uh, but what has increased a lot is using drones. So I'm going to show you some an image of a tag being put on a fin whale um, from, from my colleague Dave Wiley that they took, uh, I think it was last year, um, Gulf of California. This, so that's the drone up top. And it's dropping a suction cup tag, which is going to land, as you see, right on the back of that fin whale. And that's going to allow uh, the researchers to know what, what the whales are feeding on, how deep they're going, um, and get an idea of how they move through the ocean. Because the first time I was on the on the boat with um, Philip and Marilyn and others, really almost everything we knew about a whale was at the surface. Uh, we really didn't know what was going on below the surface, and that's where all the action is at for these whales, which really has changed uh, the way we understand whales at that point. So I've spoken a lot about poop. Um, there's also, uh, when whales die, they also have a big impact on ocean ecosystems. Um, 
in part, and this was discovered in the, the mid 1990s, whale falls or whale carcasses are enormous islands of nutrients that are falling into the deep sea. They can fall kilometers beneath the surface, though that the, at depths, there's also a limit of the amount of carbon and food that's down there. And one whale fall equals about a thousand or 2000 years of just general fall of carbon to the bottom in one single pulse. These whale fall habitats, there have been a hundred species that have been found on dead whales only on dead whales, found nowhere else in, in the deep ocean. There are also up to 40,000 individuals can be found on a single carcass. Um, one of the most common ones is Osadax or bone eater. That's the worm that you see up top there. Um, Osadax settles on the bones, it's called the bone eater, but it actually doesn't have a mouth. It doesn't have a gut. It doesn't have an anus, so it doesn't really fit in the poop dye world. Um, but it, it absorbs nutrients through the root system, and then those nutrients are um, synthesized by bacteria inside in the in, in endosymbionts in that area, and then they're releasing the, the, the carbon and the sugars back to the worm. So unique species that are only found in this area. Also turns out we've had more interest in those dead whales as we've understood uh, their role in the carbon cycle. So when whales die uh, offshore, they can sequester carbon for more than a thousand years. That area, by the time that carbon comes back, it could be centuries before it reaches the surface again. So uh, dead whales can have an impact that's comparable to a large national park system. It is certainly not going to stop global warming uh, of dead whales or the whale pump also has an impact, but it can play one small role. Uh, it's up to us to do uh, uh, the, the really the heart, the heavy lifting and, and reduce the amount of carbon we're putting out there to the ocean. So, um, 2019, I was on a Fulbright in Iceland. And I was preparing for talk, I got up early that morning, just like I did today, and realized as I put together the talk that the work that I do can be described really in three, maybe five words, which is uh, eat, poop, die, and, and pee. I also look at whale pee, but we haven't discussed that yet. Um, and as the, that moment, I realized, actually, I think that's my next book. And uh, now a couple of years later, and uh, it's due out uh, later this year in November, thanks in part to Carolyn for helping me land this with uh, Little Brown. But um, uh, that, that idea has really stuck with me. And, and I've been working on everything from whales to parrotfish to seabirds. But I really want to, I want to wrap up today talking about eating because I've been talking about the pooping and dying, but also whales change, I mean, rather animals change habitats when they eat. And maybe one of the best examples, best studied are sea otters uh, from the North Pacific. Um, they have big appetites. Sea otters have high metabolism. They eat about 25% of their body weight a day. Humans eat about 2%, dogs 2 or 3%. Um, largely benthic invertebrates, and the impact of all that eating is can be quite uh, quite remarkable. But like whales, in um, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, sea otter populations were reduced down to maybe five percent, reduced by 95 percent across uh, the North Pacific. And they were really only found on one island, about 5,000 individuals on the island of Achitka in the Aleutians. That whole area from Mexico uh, with a few individuals in California to Japan, they had been eradicated from that area. And guess what? Amchitka was scheduled uh, to have the largest underground atomic explosion in 1971. Um, and John Vanya, who was a biologist at the state of Alaska, said, look, guys, you're going to have a problem. When you, when you uh, detonate this bomb, uh, you're going to have a lot of dead otters on your hands. Um, but I can help you. 
um, because we have the manpower and we have a plan for these otters, we can translocate them. So his um, offer was, let's, if you can provide the funding, this was before the state of Alaska had discovered oil, so it was still a relatively poor state, you provide the funding and the planes and we'll move the otters out for you. Um, and they took over 500 otters and moved them to British Columbia, to Southeast Alaska, to Oregon, and to Washington. And it's really from the, the legacy of the atomic age, maybe one of the only bright ones is, they didn't use that word now, but this was an amazing example of rewilding that worked to a phenomenal extent. So moving these otters, and by the way, not all, not all were removed and some of them did die. Some of them survived on that island, so they're, they're still doing okay in Amshitka. But if we think of the Manhattan Project or the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki or the nuclear arms race, sea otters are one of the exceptions where we use the incredible money that um, was put into this for positive um, reward. And now there are 50,000 descendants of the sea otters that were moved out of Amchitka. And if any of you, have, have any of you seen sea otters? Like when, yeah, so several, right? I mean, if it's outside of Amchitka, almost certainly, unless you saw them in Monterey, there was a small population, uh, they're descendants uh, of the bomb. One out of every three otters in the entire North Pacific Ocean uh, come from that movement. So what's the impact of these otters? Uh, they're, they're really, this has been the, one of the earliest studies of an idea of what we call a trophic cascade. That is the sea otters are the top predators. They feed on sea urchins and other benthic invertebrates. The sea urchins feed on kelp. So in the absence of otters, which was a widespread throughout the North Pacific before the otters were um, reintroduced, you see the bottom there was basically what was called urchin barren. Very little kelp, lots of urchins. When the otters came back in, kelp grew and you had an increase in diversity and a big change just by one species coming in there. And, and this really has helped us start to think about this idea of, of trophic rewilding. And I'll wrap up today to discussing what the impact of that can be across the planet. Uh, otters, they're cute, right? So they also have a big role, many of you have seen them, um, in tourism, uh, about $32 million per year in Canada, uh, just on, in, on one of the islands, Vancouver Island alone. Um, cuteness matters. Actually, um, in the US, in, endangered species funding for mammals and birds, uh, and also fish, because we like to eat them. Um, but animals that we like get a lot more funding. Um, four times higher uh, investment in the Endangered Species Act than for all plants, invertebrates, reptiles, and amphibians combined. So we put a lot of money into that. It got me thinking when I was working on my book listed, what's the source of this? Why do we care so much about these charismatic mammals? So I looked in my daughter's bedroom in her toy chest and saw what were the animals sitting in that toy chest, right? And you could see some birds and dogs and um, there's, a, there's a whale there too. And probably only because she's the daughter of a biologist, there's also an isopod uh, sticking out of that toy chest. And um, I did a phylogenetic analysis on those species. There's the evolutionary tree, what it looks like. 21 of the animals in her toy chest uh, were mammals, seven birds, one reptile, and very few. I think there was one tree, and that would probably was because it was home to an owl. Um, so we, we do, you know, this is deeply sourced. And if we're going to really try and change the way we deal with the oceans and the world in general, we need to think about all the other, and not just the cute animals, but all the other ones. And we'll give you one reality check here. Um, I've been talking a lot about wild animals and there's pushback about whether wild animals matter. Um, and there's reason for that because right now on the planet, 96% um, of the biomass of all mammals on the planet are humans and our domestic animals. Two thirds of all mammals on the planet 
are cows um, and goats and pigs. We make up a third of all mammals on the biomass of all mammals and just 4% are wild mammals. That includes whales, by the way, guys. So this is, to me, my goal is to move that notch just a little bit, you know, try and get that number a little bit higher and, and same pattern um, as you can see there for birds. So what I've been thinking about is, can we you we I, I chatted about the um, the role of the Atomic Energy Commission in increasing otter populations? Can we use another crisis to increase wild animal populations? That's the climate crisis. We know for many animals, they can provide natural climate solutions. That can be anything from wildebeests in Africa to whales in the deep sea, to bison, to wool, to wolves. All of these species can have a positive role by sequestering carbon, by enhancing, as we saw with that trophic cascade, enhancing the growth of kelp or trees. If we, if we increase the animals, we can also increase the plant and use this motivation to fight the climate crisis to also save biodiversity. And with that, I'll leave us with a question. Can we replace our carbon footprint with the tracks of wild animals? Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, I think so. Um, very good job. And uh, I had to say, um, looking at your notes, it's like, if that had been my notepad, no <laughs> one would have read it. It's yeah. perfect handwriting. So, um, yeah, well, why don't we come over okay, here? Okay, sure. Um, so, uh, we'll take some questions. Um, and we will be taking questions from people online. I hope there are people in the remote audience um, who took advantage of this. So. Yeah, up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I actually, I think. So to, just, yeah. to, just in case mm -hmm. people online couldn't hear, ah. what were the little pink crabby mm -hmm. things on the bottom next to the whale fall? I think they were sea cucumbers actually that were that were there yeah but i'm not positive i have to go look back at that slide again but there are in addition to the 100 species that are only found on on the whale carcasses there are also hundreds of other species that opportunistically feed on the um the soft tissue so sharks will come in and feed first and then it's basically a succession like you would see in um in a forest there are four stages. So the first is you're feeding on the soft tissue. Then you've got this other where these animals, the Osadax worms are on that. And then finally, it's just a reef system. Uh, and not only are the animals feeding directly, but they're also feeding on the other animals that are feeding on that. So that's why you're getting all these other ones that are crawling along the edges or taking advantage of the nutrients in that system. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what's causing the kelp forest to disappear and mm -hmm. sea urchins to increase? Uh, so the, the return of sea otters is pretty limited still. So there are some areas where the sea otters like Southeast Alaska, where they're quite abundant or Vancouver Island, but there are vast areas where there are no sea otters. So they're not having an impact there. So that could be one thing. Uh, also climate change is having an impact on kelp systems as well. Uh, so I would say it's probably temperature in part and also a lack of predators and, and a shift in the ecosystem. But it's a good question. Certainly the, most of California outside of Monterey Bay, which I think is where you've read about this, uh, there, aren't, there aren't predators on sea urchins. So it's a classic urchin barren in that area. <laughs> I 
the, the question was after looking at his daughter's uh, toys, did he buy any new species? Uh, I'm sad to say I didn't, but if you saw it, I was a little embarrassed about how many there were there just alone. So I, I probably should have maybe taken a few out rather than added a few in. But uh, now I have a new mission. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Uh, so the question is, how much more productive is the Bay of Fundy than other areas, and do right whales fare better there? Yeah, that's a good question that that Philip and Marilyn will know very well. Um, so it, it is a productive ecosystem, and uh, because there's so much mixing, so let's compare it, let's just say to right here, to areas off of Massachusetts, you have what's called a spring bloom. So in the spring, there are a lot of nutrients and the phytoplankton, the algae take off and it's very productive. But then in the summer, uh, the nutrients are reduced and you have very low productivity. In an area like the Bay of Fundy, that, that the sort of nutrient mixing is higher. And we looked at the role of, of right whales in that area in 2015 and showed that it could, it could have a big impact uh, in, in moving nitrogen in that system. Sadly, uh, they don't feed there anymore. Uh, they've now moved up and around to the, the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, and they're very, I, I don't know, did you see any there last year? How many uh, whales? We didn't, we didn't go. You didn't even go. Because, yes. Because they right. stopped. So. Yeah. So there were a couple. They, they, it's likely, and Philip can answer this better than I can. So please jump in. But it's likely they were following their food. They were looking for copepods. And this probably has a climate. Um, one, one of the reasons the shift is because of climate. So it, it is productive, but it's changing and very quickly. I don't know if you have any comments about the whales. No. I mean, that, that basically covers it. There's, it's a very complex system that um, aggregates food that right whales feed on. And it's a combination of changes in ocean currents that are partially climate uh, change related that has impacted the quality and the quantity of the food there. Um, so it's, it's sort of aside from the tides, which are pretty extraordinary. Um, so we have one question um, from our remote audience. In your book, do you address the destruction of small vertebrates and in invertebrates that are obligate to vernal pools, for example, being destroyed by widespread logging and certainly not helped by recent support, Supreme Court rulings? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I, I do have two chapters on insects. I, for the purposes of keeping it tight, plus we're at the aquarium, I focused more on aquatic systems. Um, but yes, I do briefly discuss um, some of the, the movement of frogs. So wood frogs, for example, which are found here, there has been um, some measurement that they can move nutrients into these pools where they're found. So that's, that's short. But I talk about cicadas, the cicada emergence that came up a couple of years ago, and there's an enormous pulse of carcasses in that case. And also uh, looking at midgets, which you'd think, well, how much could a, an animal this small um, have an impact, but when they number in the trillions, then you then you can really see that shift. Um, yes, and and I agree. I was concerned about that ruling as well, and and I hope um, I think it's the Mississippi gopher frog. I hope we can bring those back as well and <laughs> see some ecological impact. That sort of brings up the question about one of the reasons, again, like I mentioned with the mammals, why we often don't see the impacts of a lot of these species is because. They're so rare compared to what they used to be. I live in Vermont. There used to be vernal pools everywhere. And uh, now they're beautiful and, and a great place to visit, but they're pretty uncommon. We've done so much alteration of the um, water table in that area and, and those areas. Yeah. Okay.
So uh, the question is, um, was there a big difference between the su success rate at finding poop with drones versus dogs? And is there anything new on the front that would also increase it more? Yeah, so these were different species to be. So it's a, it's a different research teams and different species. And I don't know if anyone is that, I'm not aware of any comparison of those two. I can give you anecdotal, um, anecdotal, thoughts from this and that certainly when we used to look for defecations, you're looking from a Zodiac very low to the water and you would occasionally see it when you have a, a drone up top with a camera on it, you can see, I don't know, many times more. Um, so I, I can't compare it to the dogs, but I can tell you that that has really enhanced our, our ability to see it and increasingly to collect it, because now you can also use dr drones to collect everything from whale breath to, like you saw that tag that's put on the whales, to defecations themselves. So we're just at the start of how much we're going to be able to learn through drones, both up in the air as well as putting more um, automatic uh, gliders in the water that can detect feces as well. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, so go ahead. The, the, the question is that we, we know that there's harm from too much nitrogen runoff on the surface. And what's the difference with having uh, the benefits of nitrogen? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so if phosphorus and nitrogen, they're both sort of the same story. We often have, we suffer from too little in some places and um, an excess in others. And so uh, nitrogen runoff off the Mississippi, for example, there's what's called an, an, an anoxic zone or a dead zone that's the size of Connecticut every summer. So it's enormous, and way too much nitrogen going into that system. Whales are putting it, for example, in uh, more offshore and in areas where they're feeding, where that, those, that is being picked up by phytoplankton and moved through that system a lot more quickly. We don't have any evidence, and I don't know, it might have existed that, that there would be some sort of anoxic or oxygen depleted system in areas where whales feed. Um, but certainly that is a concern in some areas when you have runoff really from agricultural activity, from industry, as well as from suburban lawns. Uh, so it is a balance. And, and that would be true for, for um, any of these um, nutrients that we're talking about. It's a good question. Yep, up in the back. <laughs> so the question is that you mentioned whale pee and how do you sample it and how do you quantify it? Yeah. So if you think that trying to find whale poop is hard, think about whale pee. Absolutely. I've only seen it in once or twice, like in, and once is this amazing uh, footage when one of those suction cup tags is on a calf, a humpback calf, and mom pees right next to, right next to the calf. So you see this green curtain and then occasionally males when they're at the surface and they're on their backs, you might see them pee. So it's very rare, but I, I actually cut this out in the interest of time today, but we do have a paper um, that's in review now, right now. We call it the Great Whale Conveyor Belt. And why whale pee matters is whales feed at high latitudes and then have the longest migrations of any mammal on the planet. And they breed in low, la in low latitudes, clear waters that have low nutrients. So we've measured how much nitrogen is moved by whale pee, as well as uh, by placentas and as well as carcasses, because calves die at a higher rate than the adults do. And um, we found that, like that, that um, comparison I did for the rivers and for the nitrogen and the poop, um, they, 
whales release more nitrogen into the area of Hawaii where they breed than all of the natural movement of nitrogen in that system. So we think that it can have a major impact. I hope the reviewer doesn't ask us to go out and measure it ourselves <laughs> though, <laughs> but we'll work on it. <laughs> All right, one more from online. Uh, when the drone drops the suction cup tag, there was a little bit that floated in the ocean. Is that harmful to the ocean animals? Mm. Piece of the I see. Uh, I, I, that, I didn't set that one off. I am, I'm gonna say that I'm almost certain that Dave Wiley and those, the folks that worked on that went and retrieved that to the best. I mean, they weren't that far away, so. Uh, yeah, we, we wouldn't leave any more plastic than we had to. And by the way, those the, those suction cup tags are very expensive. You are very motivated to get that back. So you're not leaving any of that in the ocean unless you're really unlucky. Yeah, yep. So how long does the suction cup stay on the oil? Yeah, I mean... If you're lucky, I would say 24 hours. I don't know what your guys' record was, but a few hours to up to 24 hours, um, typically. And uh, you, you know, you can find everything again from where the animals are moving, what they're feeding, how they're interacting with each other. Some of the cameras that then that, by the way, the P that I saw was, was from a suction cup tag um, that was that, as I had mentioned, that was on a cab. Um, the interaction between different whales is really what we've learned uh, enormously, like the way that humpback whales can cooperatively feed or maybe stealing from each other at times. Um, so even in that 24 hour window, um, there's enormous amount of information that we get from. Anybody else? Yep. Yeah, no, it's good. What's next for you? Are there any species you want to work with that you haven't? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one of my, one of the species, because it's not hard enough to work on North Atlantic right whales, which are about down to about 350 and there's, uh, they're fighting off so many human impacts. I've been working more on the Gulf of Mexico whale, which is the one that I had shown the picture of. Um, they are found off the coast of Florida. We're just start, we, Again, the species was only discovered a couple of years ago, so we didn't know what they fed on that we're starting to learn. What I really want to know is they're now found in the small pocket off the coast of um, the Panhandle, but historically they were found all the way to Mexico. And there we've been putting out or the government's been putting out acoustic um, help me out with the like did, uh, passive yeah, acoustics passive yeah passive yeah. acoustics um to listen for whales and, and we're finding that they're also found off the coast of west texas um so my dream is i was pretty I, I wasn't very optimistic about this whale in the beginning um but i do think that there is a future they're highly endangered by um oil and gas extraction in the gulf and that has to end and hopefully soon, if we can get these whales through that, they used to be found off the coast of the Mississippi where there's now a lot of oil extraction. If we can keep them around long enough so they can get back there, um, that's, that's one of my big motivations going forward is trying to find how we can get these, these whales back. All right, we can take one or two more. Yep. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Um, Borg Thor Magnuson was the research director at the time, and, and he invited me to join him. And by the way, um, a lot of the researchers there are older than the island. Right, so that you know they were born in, and so are the birds. By the way, the fulmars can live more than fifty or sixty years. So some of the birds have been around since that time, and that's what really blows your mind. It's just how young 
that island is, there's a small research station, so the cabin, where, and, and basically the kitchen table is also, the desk is also where everyone is, and, and a few bunk beds in that area. And you can walk the length of the island, I don't know, a few hours, right? So you really can see the whole island in a very short time. Um, I'm meeting some of the birds was funny because uh, full Mars, at least from a human point of view, look about, I have pictures of individual full Mars with the researchers from 50 years ago and the researchers now, you know, have lost their hair and grade and full Mars look exactly the same, you know, they look as young as good as they ever did. They, they wear well. They wear well, they age well. <laughs> All right, we take one more. Yep. How many hours do a whale, do whales sleep for and do they need to breathe? They do need to breathe. The picture that comes to mind, it's different for different species and maybe Philip can answer what he thinks for right whales because I don't have a good answer for that. But for sperm whales, for example, um, you see them, there are pictures of them hanging just below the surface. And uh, so, and they're coming up for air, I would say, every 20 minutes, half an hour? Do you have a sense for that? I mean, I multiple times in an hour, but they're, the, of the species that we know have some sense of sleep, they are coming up to, they, they are coming up to breathe. I don't know if you have an idea for right whales. Yeah, I mean, for right whales, they don't, they don't sleep like we do. We think that most marine whales actually sleep, rest half of their brain for part of the time and half the brain for the other, because they actually have to be conscious enough to breathe. We're, we do it involuntarily, they do it voluntarily. So they don't sleep like quite like, like we do. And so they definitely do breathe. All right, well, thank you thank so you. much, Joe. Mm -hmm. Good turnout. Great, thank you. Um, so tonight's event was made possible with the generous support from the Lowell Institute allows the aquarium to offer the, these lectures free of charge. If you enjoy this program and want to help support our ocean education and conservation work, please consider giving to the aquarium's Mission Forward Fund at neaq.org. If you are with us in person this evening, our cash bar will be open for another half an hour in the lobby. And to those of you who joined us virtually this evening, we're so glad you did and thank you for your questions. Um, we look forward to continuing our lecture series in the fall, which will kick off with Cy Montgomery on September 21st. So thank you all very much for coming and for Joe, thank it was you. a wonderful evening. Thanks. Thanks.